chaos on the streets of Kenosha, Wisconsin. Multiple buildings set on fire, including a Wisconsin Department of Corrections building. The unrest coming after the police shooting of a black man on Sunday. Right here was the battle zone. In front of that was a complete line from, from that corner all the way down of officers. People would be from here to that grass area. And if you tried to like pass the grass area or even try to step in the grass area, that's when they would shoot the canisters and tear gas. This end was the chaotic end. This corner here, they had the dumpster trucks blocking off the street. So couldn't no cars get through on this street and they were on fire. They did have this gate that surrounded the entire courthouse. So you couldn't get up there. You couldn't get to the courthouse anymore. Um, but they had a, a fence, a tall fence and it was people rocking it, trying to knock it over to get in there. <laughs> they were angry. We were angry. I was angry, you know, because you get tired of it. On the evening of Sunday, August 23rd, 2020, Kenosha Police Department officers were dispatched to a resident, residence in the 2800 block of 40th Street after a female caller reported that her boyfriend was present and was not supposed to be on the premises. During the incident, officers attempted to arrest Jacob S. Blake, age 29. Uh, law enforcement deployed a taser to attempt to stop Mr. Blake, uh, but the taser was not successful in stopping him. Mr. Blake walked around his vehicle, opened the driver's side door, and leaned forward. While holding on to Mr. Blake's shirt, Officer Rustin Shesky fired his service weapon seven times. That could have been my brother. That could have been my son, my dad, my uncle. You just get tired of seeing it. And, and, it, and you, you know, you used to seeing it in other cities. But when it hits home, you feel like, listen, I, I, gotta, I gotta say something because I gotta live here. That antenna up there is the thing they use to make noise and knock out our phones. They had the armored truck in that corner. And then you had a guy that was standing up in the top of the armored truck and they were just shooting. They ran us all away. From right here, we get right there. We like, something on fire, something smoking. That's when the car lot was set on fire. This started with a couple of cars being set on fire uh, and the entire car lot went up. In all this area that's open right now, this was literally filled with cars. So he's slowly but surely, you know, clearing everything out. Uh, but I mean, his entire business is, is gone. There wasn't a single vehicle here that was salvaged. Uh, but law enforcement just kept pushing them further and further down this road, <clears throat> you know, telling them to disperse. Uh, they're throwing, you know, bricks at them, rocks. Uh, they're shooting off fireworks at, at law enforcement. And when we get to, uh, this stoplight up here, 60th Street. So this is the, the gas station where most of those militia were gathered up. Law enforcement intentionally pushed that entire group of protesters right into the hands of all these armed militia people. You just knew something bad was, was gonna happen. Somebody was getting shot that night. You could feel it in the air. Directly across from us is the spot where Joseph Rosenbaum was shot. In several of the videos that are out there, you hear somebody call for a medic. Uh, 
at that point is when you see Kyle Rittenhouse running down Sheridan Road southbound. Following behind him is Joseph Rosenbaum, uh, and then also uh, Joshua Zeminski and, and his wife. You see Kyle Rittenhouse run through this parking lot, uh, and then Joseph Rosenbaum coming up behind him, and, uh, and then he was shot. And then uh, shortly after, uh, you have more gunshots that rang out from Rittenhouse. Uh, that's where he hits Anthony Huber and kills him. And then where uh, Gage Grosskertz is, is hit in the arm. Uh, so we start making our way down this way and we see Rittenhouse come running up the center of, of Sheridan Road. Um, and you just hear people, you know, yelling out, you know, stop him, stop him. He just shot somebody. Literally where we were standing, uh, there were bullets that were flying past us. So we started grabbing people and uh, kind of pushing them in between the houses that are, that are up the road there and then kind of retreating and making our way into the hospital parking lot, you know, kind of behind all this brick structures and everything. This road is always going to be remembered, you know, as the, the street that, you know, two people died and another person was, you know, seriously injured. It obviously changed a lot of people's lives that night. I think it could have been avoided had law enforcement just kept everybody in that park contained instead of pushing them into, you know, further down these streets and further into these neighborhoods up here. What we experienced here in Kenosha was a massive influx of um, highly emotional people. And they ranged from far right uh, to far left. And there was definitely political opinions involved uh, in this civil unrest as well. Uh, we did the best that we could uh, to maintain uh, the safety of life and property. There is a constitutional right uh, in the United States to carry a firearm. Uh, local militia groups choose to exercise that right, as did several other citizens who chose to come out and partake in um, rallies, demonstrations, or protests. No one specific group received any special treatment over another. Uh, we enforce the law fairly um, and when it's appropriate. I don't think there's a problem with racism. Um, I have not seen racism here uh, in the 22 years that I have been here. I believe that there is a disconnect. I believe that there is things that our community can do, and I believe that there are things that our city government and this police department can do to improve community relations. But I have not seen racist or biased uh, police action. By denying a reality of some of their, the citizens in the community that they're, they're sworn to serve and protect, uh, they're living under a false narrative and they're not able to then truly reflect on their behaviors, why they're doing what they're doing and, and be able to bring changes. I think too often in our country we have, when we talk about racism or racist, you know, people are like, I'm not a member of the Ku Klux Klan, I am not, um, you know, outwardly racist and saying that I hate people and so that means I'm not racist, but we understand that that that's not really what we're talking about when we, we get into systemic racism, right? We're talking about a belief system uh, where people believe that a, one race is better than another, right? And then how we have baked those things into our policies and procedures, right? Uh, and that's what racism is. So, you know, we have to come together to have these conversations, to have a shared definition of what we're talking about, and for people to be able to see how that impacts then individual lives, right? Um, it, how it's impacting African Americans in our community, but also how it's impacting the police. To see the flames, it felt like you could hear cries of so much anger, you could hear the anger in those flames and it was, it was, like I said, it was, it was very sad to stand right there and look down here and see this and, and see this entire strip be on fire. 
this is what we had in this neighborhood. They had already closed the grocery store down over there and that had been closed for like five years. So this is what we had for this area. Now we gotta go and travel far to get what we need or anything of that nature. When it was all accessible to this entire community, this was a furniture store that everyone shopped at. He was like the come to guy for furniture here, the furniture warehouse. And then you had the, the hall right here that's not operating anymore. And then right here was the Danish Lodge. And we would actually come here every other Friday and have bingo. The whole city would come out. Yeah, it was nice. I miss it. Up above here was the main, that was the main, the main hall. Up, up above from the top, almost all the way over, actually all the way over to, to the whole. Some of the locals that were in, in this area here when we had our bingos were always here. They're gonna miss that. They're gonna miss the, the ability to come here where they could even walk here rather than drive here and participate in a relatively inexpensive fun night. Uh, they're gonna miss that. What, what did we do to hurt anybody? We welcome everybody here. Yeah, and so there was no, uh, you know, there was literally no reason whatsoever for a fire to start like this, to, to do this to us. So that's the part that hurts, I think. Yeah, it hurts us probably more than anything else. Why? <laughs> Why? Did we, what did we do? You know? So. In the uptown and the downtown, there are a lot of uh, storefronts um, that actually have apartments uh, up above them too. So there are signs out there, boards on windows that say children live here and you know people live here, things like that. So uh, that was not done on police advice. Um, that was done on property owners and people trying to protect their property. With the Biden presidency, um, you know, I have hope for, for unity in the country. I have hope for um, human rights for all people. Um, I have hope for open dialogue and, uh, and compromise and discussion. Um, my fears are the pushback that there are people who are so fearful of shared power across different identities keep us from moving forward and keeping uh, they'll keep pushing back against that arc uh, that bends towards justice. And um, that saddens me because they don't see that that arc that's bending towards justice is for them as well. So um, I do have a lot of hopes, but I, I fear that there will be people uh, just trying to, to block him and block uh, Vice President Harris uh, at every, every turn.